India has one of the world's great garden-making traditions. But what we know about its ancient gardens comes only from books, like the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. The reason for this is that ancient building materials were timber and mud, not stone. My list of the ten most beautiful and famous gardens in India, in date order, is as follows. The Lodi Garden, Humayun's Tomb Garden, Shalimar Bagh, the Taj Mahal Garden, the Yadavindra Garden, the Amber Palace Garden, the Lake Palaces in Udaipur, Sahelian Kibari, Rashtrapati Bhavun, and the Nek Chand Rock Garden. For a tourist like me, the best gardens are more beautiful and famous than botanical. Here's what I like about them. The Lodi Garden in Delhi is an intriguing green refuge from the city's often not too clean air. The garden contains the tombs of the Lodis, who ruled this part of India in the 15th century. The tombs might have been in woodland when they were built, but by the 20th century the land had become a village and the tombs were used as dwellings. The Archaeological Survey of India had the idea of protecting the tombs by making their setting into a green space. In 1936, it became a public garden, which now has some labelled plants. The old tombs stand like temples to ancient gods in an English landscape garden. It works well, and they bring nature into a city which could definitely do with some more of it. Humayun's splendid tomb garden dates from about 1565. It's near the Yamuna River and not far from the Lodi Garden. The tomb was built for a Mughal emperor, Humayun, whose father, Baba, had introduced the Chahaba to India. The son's tomb garden is now the world's outstanding example of a four-square garden plan. It has a grid lattice of pools, channels and fountains. The tomb itself took 16 years to build and cost 15 lakh of rupees. In the 19th century, the area within the garden wall had become a tangled waste. Today, the water features have been beautifully restored and the gardens are well kept if rather more English than they should be. The garden symbolises the emperor's expected place in paradise and can provide every visitor with a foretaste of its delights. It has four kilometres of water channels and unlike many examples of this type of garden in India, they've got water in them. Shalimar Bagh snuggles between Lake Dal in Kashmir and the great Himalaya range of mountains. The garden was begun by the emperor Jahangir and his wife, Nur Jahan, wanting a summer retreat from the scorching heat of Agra. They travelled to Kashmir with an elephant train and a small army to keep them safe. Their garden known as the abode of love, was used for picnics and other outings. They lived in a fort on the other side of Lake Dal and came across by boat, also using a canal which survives. Shalimar Bagh had a private garden for the emperor and another for the ladies of his court with a throne and a waterfall. The original planting 
is likely to have been chenar trees and annual plants and bulbs, as it still is, and many fruit trees were also grown. The Taj Mahal in Agra is India's most famous garden. An English poet, Edward Lear, described it well. This perfect and most lovely building infinitely surpassed all I had expected, principally on account of its size and its colour. It is quite impossible to imagine a more beautiful or wonderful sight. What a garden! the great centre of the picture being ever the vast, glittering, ivory-white Taj Mahal, and the dark green of the cypresses, with rich yellow-green trees of all sorts, and innumerable flights of bright green parrots flitting across like live emeralds. The design is a classical chahaba, and a unique feature is its projection across the river Yamuna to the moonlight garden. Parties came here to see the Taj and the moon reflected in the river. The garden also projects into the town of Agra as the Taj Gange. Rabindranath Tagore referred to the Taj Mahal as a teardrop on the cheek of eternity. The Yadavindra Garden in Pinjore is a lush Mughal garden with pavilions, waterfalls, fountains and a central canal. The Pinjore estate was built for a Mughal prince and was once occupied by an English landscape architect, Constance Villiers Stewart, and she loved it dearly. The garden is laid out on three levels – and she saw the lowest of these levels as a real Indian garden. I think what she meant by this is that it was a flowery orchard and that this was probably the character of ancient Hindu gardens. She was the author of the first ever book on Indian gardens and believed that Luchin's plan for New Delhi should have used Hindu instead of Mughal design principles. He read her book on the boat trip from England, but was not persuaded. I think she was right. The Amber Palace outside Jaipur was described by a 19th-century traveller as the greatest of all the attractions in Jaipur. He also wrote that a spacious lake is reached in the centre of which is a deserted palace, only accessible by boat. Basking on the banks and small islands are a number of enormous alligators, while others swim slowly about with their ugly backs just above the water. The reptiles have gone. A Frenchman wrote that, You enter a court surrounded by palaces, rich in mosaics and sculptures, in the centre of which is a fairy-like garden. The Amber Palace has two garden courts, and there's a marvellous restored garden on an island in the lake below the fort. It used to be visited by the ladies of the harem at night to enjoy the white-scented flowers. It's called the saffron garden, but in such a dry climate, saffron crocuses would have to have been replanted each autumn.
The lake palaces in Udaipur are dream gardens, but more an account of their spatial character and surroundings than their detailed design. In 1891, a traveller wrote that Udaipur is the loveliest city in India. It is placed on the banks of a superb sheet of artificial water, the vast palace dominating the entrance. It's like the Grand Canal of Venice, translated to Lake Como. One of the palace islands is now a luxury hotel and was made famous by its use in the James Bond film Octopussy. It occupies the whole surface of the small island with the lake lapping the gleaming white walls. The courtyards, fountains and gardens were used for darbars and other celebrations, as they still are. A 19th century visitor wrote that Marble is the only stone employed in their construction. Pillars, vaults, reservoirs, garden walks, all are of marble, either white or black. The walls are ornamented with glittering mosaics, and the principal chambers are decorated with historical frescoes. Immense mango trees and tamarinds shade these beautiful palaces. Sahilian Kibari, the Garden of the Maidens, was designed as a peaceful retreat outside the old city of Udaipur. It's said to have been made for the 48 girls that Maharana Singh II was given as part of his dowry. The central feature of the garden is an enclosed courtyard with a central tank of water. It has a white marble chatri fountain at the centre of the pool and black marble chatris at the corners of the enclosure. In the gardens beyond, there are fountains, pools, lawns, flowers and trees. Many of the fountains are in brightly coloured cast iron. They were made in England, but look more at home with the tropical planting than in their country of origin. A large circular fountain pool is ornamented with marble elephants and cool fountains. The 19th century was a time when English gardens incorporated Indian features and Indian gardens used English features. The design style of both can be called Victorian. And if the world has a better example of this style than Sahelian Kibari, I don't know of it. Rashtrapati Bhavun, the President's House in Delhi, has the best-loved flower garden in India. Its planting is now more exuberant than when it was completed in 1929. The planting style, which is bright, gay and colourful, has ancestors both in Indian miniature paintings and in English carpet bedding. The original planting design was by a Kew-trained plantsman. His name was William Musto. The garden design was by Edwin Lutyens and has three parts. A square, Chahaba garden near the palace and a rectangular garden which leads to a circular garden, also called the butterfly garden. The squareness of the square garden relates to Humayun's tomb and its wide canals to Shalimar Bagh. East of Rashtrapati Bhavun, Lachin's plan draws on western precedence. The Raj path leads to the India Gate.
The Nek Chand Rock Garden in Chandigarh is surprising, charming, cool, fresh and wonderful. It's in a wooded canyon with its own stream. The garden was made illegally by a road inspector. He did the early work as a hobby in his spare time and without the authorities knowing that he was doing it. When they found out, it was agreed that the garden could remain in place and it's now very popular. Nek Chan saw it as a recreation of the village in Pakistan which he had fled at the time of India's 1947 partition. There are crowds of small, friendly men and women. They're made out of waste material, including ceramic insulators, broken pots and old cans. Like the visitors, the sculptures gaze at the wooded gorge and the water features. The overall design may have been inspired, consciously or unconsciously, by the Hindu epics. The Ramayana and the Mahabharata also have large castes, and events often take place in forests. Lord Rama was the seventh avatar of Vishnu, and the stories are of humans interacting with gods. Well, that's the end of my top ten list. There's more information about the individual gardens and their historical contexts on the gardenvisit.com website and in the chapters I wrote on Hindu, Buddhist and Muslim gardens in a 2011 book on Asian gardens. It would be a great project to recreate an ancient Hindu palace and garden somewhere in India. The Mahabharata and the paintings in the caves at Ajanta would be good starting points. But experts on Vastu Shastra, art, architecture and gardens would be needed. My guess is that the chosen building materials would be mud and timber and that the building would have courtyards, a bowley, a flowery forest and glades. To raise the money, it could be a hotel and restaurant with a garden open to the public for a small fee. <laughs>